Greetings. This is Bradford Donald Keller Townsend, and this is a forward research report, and it's called Deep Fakes and Disinformation. Uh, I'm going to read an article and then comment on it. It's not a very long article, so please hang in there with me. It's from Foreign Affairs Magazine. Uh, I subscribe to this magazine, uh, and it's the Council on Foreign Relations. Our friends, uh, the Rockefeller family, are uh, important uh, to this uh, institution. And I've had members of my family, uh, members of the Council on Foreign Relations for decades, uh, Deep Fakes and the New Disinformation War, The Coming Age of Post-Truth Geopolitics. It is written by Robert Chesney and Danielle Citron. A pic this is a really good article. <laughs> a picture may be worth a thousand words, but there is nothing that persuades quite like an audio or video recording of an event. At a time when partisans can barely agree on facts, such persuasiveness might seem as if it could bring a welcome clarity. Audio and video recordings allow people to become first-hand witnesses of an event, sparing them the need to decide whether to trust someone else's account of it. And thanks to to smartphones, which made it easy to capture audio and video content, and social media platforms, which allow that content to be shared and consumed. People today can rely on their own eyes and ears to an unprecedented degree. Therein lies a great danger. Imagine a video depicting the Israeli Prime Minister in private conversation with a colleague, seemingly revealing a plan to carry out a series of political assassinations in Tehran, or an audio clip of Iranian officials planning a covert operation to kill Sunni leaders in a particular province of Iraq, or a video showing an American general in Afghanistan burning a Quran. In a world already primed for violence, such recordings would have a powerful potential for incitement. Now imagine that these recordings could be faked using tools available to almost anyone with a laptop and access to the internet, and that resulting fakes are also convincing and that they are impossible to distinguish from the real thing. Advances in digital technology could soon make this nightmare a reality. Thanks to the rise of deep fakes, highly realistic and difficult to detect digital manipulations of audio or video, it is becoming easier than ever to portray, portray someone saying or doing something he or she never said or did. Worse, the means to create deep fakes are literally likely to proliferate quickly, producing an ever-widening circle of actors capable of deploying them for political purposes. Disinformation is an ancient art, of course, and one with renewed relevance today. But as deep fake technology develops and spreads, the current disinformation wars may soon look like propaganda equivalent of era of swords and shields. Dawn of the deep fakes. Deep fakes are the product of recent advances in a form of artificial intelligence known as deep learning, in which sets of algorithms called neural networks learn to infer rules and replicate patterns by shifting through large data sets. Google, for example, has used this technique to develop powerful image classification algorithms for its search engine. Deep fakes emerge from a specific type of deep learning in which pairs of algorithms are pitted against each other in generative adversarial networks, or GANs. In a GAN, one algorithm, the generator, creates content modeled on source data. 
For instance, making artificial images of cats from a database of real cat pictures. While a second algorithm, the discriminator, tries to spot the artificial content, pick out the fake cat images. Since each algorithm is constantly training against the other, such pairings can lead to rapid improvement allowing GANs to produce highly realistic yet fake audio and video content. This technology has the potential to proliferate widely. Commercial and even free deep fake services have already appeared in the open market. Versions with alarmingly few safeguards are likely to emerge on the black market. The spread of these services will lower the barriers to entry, meaning that soon the only practical constraint on one's ability to produce a deep fake will be access to training materials, that is, audio and video of the person to be modeled, to feed the GAN. The capacity to create professional-grade forgeries will come within reach of nearly anyone with sufficient interest and the knowledge of where to go for help. Deep fakes have a number of worthy applications. Modified audio or video of a historical figure, for example, could be created for the purpose of educating children. One company even claims that it can use the technology to restore speech to individuals who have lost their voice to disease. But deep fakes can and will be used for darker purposes as well. Users have already employed deep fake technology to insert people's faces into pornography, pornography without their consent or knowledge. The growing ease of making fake audio and video content will create ample opportunities for blackmail, intimidation, and sabotage. The most frightening applications of deep fake technology, however, may well be in the realms of politics and international affairs. There, deep fakes may be used to create unusually effective lies capable of inciting violence, discrediting leaders and institutions, or even tipping elections. Deep fakes have the potential to be especially destructive because they are arriving at a time when it already is becoming harder to separate fact from fiction. For much of the 20th century, magazines, newspapers, and television broadcasters managed the flow of information to the public. Journalists established rigorous professional standards to control the quality of news and the relative relatively small number of mass media outlets meant that only a limited number of individuals and organizations could contribute information widely. Over the last decade, however, more and more people have begun to get their information from social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter, which demand on vast array of users to generate relatively unfiltered content. Users tend to curate their experiences so that they mostly encounter perspectives they already agree with, a tendency heightened by the platform's algorithms, turning their social media feeds into echo chambers. These platforms are also susceptible to so-called information cascades, whereby people pass along information shared by others without bothering to check to see if it's even true, making it appear more credible in the process. The end result is the falsehoods can spread faster than ever before. These dynamics will make social media fertile ground for circulating deep fakes with potentially explosive implications for politics. Russia's attempt to influence the 2016 U.S. presidential election, spreading divisive and politically inflammatory messages on Facebook 
and Twitter. Already demonstrated how easily disinformation can be injected into the social media bloodstream. The deep fakes of tomorrow will be more vivid and realistic and thus more shareable than the fake news of 2016. And because people are especially prone to sharing negative and novel information, the more salacious the deep fakes, the better. Demona, dem, <coughs> democratizing fraud. The use of fraud and forgery and other forms of deception to influence politics is nothing new, of course, when the USS Maine exploded in Havana Harbor in 1898, American tabloids misused misleading accounts of the incident to incite public, the public toward war with Spain. The anti-Semitic tract Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which, toward, which described a fictional Jewish conspiracy circulated widely during the first half of the 20th century. More recently, Technologies such as Photoshop have made doctoring images as easy as forging text. What makes deep fakes unprecedented is their combination of quality, applicability, to, pers <coughs> to persuasive formats such as audio and video, and resistance to detection. And as deep fake technology spreads... An ever-increasing number of actors will be able to convincingly manipulate audio and video content in a way that once was restricted to Hollywood studios or the most well-funded intelligence agencies. Deep fakes will be particularly useful to non-state actors such as insurgent groups and terrorist organizations which have historically lacked the resources to make and assimilate fraudulent yet credible audio or video content. These groups will be able to depict their adversaries, <coughs> excuse me, including government officials spouting inflammatory words or engaging in provocative actions with the specific content carefully chosen to maximize the galvanizing impact on their target audiences. An affiliate of the Islamic State or ISIS, for instance, could create a video depicting a United States soldier shooting civilians or discussing a plan to bomb a mosque, thereby aiding the terrorist group's recruitment. Such videos will be especially difficult to debunk in cases where the target audience already distrusts the person shown in the deepfake. States can, and no doubt will, make parallel use of deep fakes to undermine their non-state opponents. Deep fakes will also exacerbate the disinformation wars that increasingly disrupt domestic politics in the United States and elsewhere. In 2016, Russia's state-sponsored disinformation operations were remarkably successful in deepening existing social cleavages in the United States. To cite just one example, fake Russian accounts on social media claiming to be affiliated with the Black Lives Matter movement shared inflammatory content purposely designed to stoke racial tensions. Next time, instead of tweets and Facebook posts, such disinformation could come in the form of fake video of a white police officer shooting shouting racial slurs while shooting, or Black Lives Matter act act activists calling for violence. Perhaps the most acute threat associated with deep fakes is the possibility that a well-timed forgery could tip an election. In May 2017, Moscow attempted something along these lines. On the eve of the French election, Russian hackers tried to undermine the presidential campaign of Emmanuel Macron, by releasing a cache of stolen documents, many of them doctored. That effort failed for a number of reasons, including the relatively boring nature of the documents and the effects of a French media law that prohibits election coverage 
in the 44 hours immediately before a vote. But in most countries, most of the time, there is no media blackout. And nature of deep fakes means that damaging content can be generated to be a salacious or worse. A convincing video with, in which Macron appeared to admit to corruption released on social media only 24 hours before the election could have spread like wildfire and proved a, impossible to debunk in time. A deep fake combining the face of Nicolas Cage with the head of Tucker Carlson. University at Albany, State University of New York. Deep fakes may also erode democracy in other less direct ways. The problem is not just that fake deep fakes can be used to stoke social and ideological divisions. They can create a liar's dividend as people become more aware of the existence of deep fakes public figures caught in genuine recordings of misbehavior will find it easier to cast doubt on the evidence against them. If deep fakes were prevalent during the 2016 U.S. presidential election, imagine how much easier it would have been for Donald Trump to have disputed the authenticity of the infamous audio tape in which he brags about groping women. More broadly, as the public becomes sensitized to the threat of deep fakes, it may become less inclined to trust news in general. And journalists, for their part, may become more wary about relying on, let alone publishing, audio or video of fast-breaking events for fear the evidence will turn out to be faked. Deep fix. There is no silver bullet for countering deep fakes. There are several legal and technological approaches, some already existing, others likely to emerge, that can help mitigate the threat. But none will overcome the problem altogether, and instead of full solutions, the rise of deep fakes calls for resilience. Three technological approaches deserve special attention. The first relates to forensic technology or the detection of forgeries through technical means. Just as researchers are putting a, gen a great deal of time and effort into creating credible fakes, so too are they developing methods of enhanced detection. In June 2018, computer scientists at Dartmouth and the University at Albany State University of New York announced that they had created a program that detects deep fakes by looking for abnormal patterns of eyelid movement when the subject of the video blinks. In the deep fakes arm race, however, such advances serve only to inform the next wave of innovation. In the future, GANs will be fed training videos that include examples of normal blinking, and even if extremely capable detection algorithms do emerge, the speed with which deep fakes can circulate on social media will make debunking them an uphill battle. By the time the forensic alarm bell rings, the damage may already be done. A second technological remedy involves authenticating content before it ever spreads, an approach sometimes referred to as digital provenance. Solution companies such as TruePic are developing ways to digitally watermark audio, photo, and video content at the moment of its creation using metadata that can be logged immutably on a distributed ledger or blockchain. In other words, one could effectively stamp content with a record of authenticity that could be used later as a reference to compare to subjected fakes. In theory, digital province solutions are an ideal fix. In practice, they face two big obstacles. First, they would need to be ubiquitously deployed in the vast array of devices that capture content, including laptops and smartphones. Second, their use would need to be made a precondition for uploading content to the most popular digital platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Neither condition is likely to be met. 
device makers absent some legal or regulatory obligation will not adopt digital authentication until they know it is affordable, in demand, and unlikely to interfere with performance of their products. A few social media platforms will want to block people from uploading unauthenticated content, especially when the first one to do so will risk losing market share to less rigorous competitors. A third, more speculative technological approach involves what has been called authenticated alibi services, which might soon begin emerging from the private sector. Consider that deep fakes are especially dangerous in high-profile individuals, such as politicians, celebrities, with valuable but fragile reputations. To protect themselves against deep fakes, some of these individuals may choose to engage in enhanced forms of life blogging, the practice of recording nearly every aspect of one's life in order to prove that they were and what they were saying or doing at any given time. Companies might begin offering bundles of alibi services, <laughs> including wearables to make life logging convenient, storage to cope with the vast amount of resulting data, the credible authentication of those data. These bundles could even include partnerships with major news and social media platforms which would enable rapid confirmation or debunking of content. Such logging would be deeply invasive and many people would want nothing to do with it. But in addition to the high-profile individuals who choose to adopt life logging to protect themselves, some employers might begin insisting on it for certain categories of employees, <coughs> much as police departments increasingly require officers to use body cams. And even if only a relatively small number of top took up intensive life logging, they would produce vast repositories of data in which the rest of us would find ourselves inadvertently caught creating a massive peer-to-peer -peer surveillance network for constantly recording activities. Laying down the law. If these technological fixes have limited upsides, what about legal remedies? Depending on circumstances, making or sharing a deep fake could constitute defamation, fraud, or misappropriation of a per person's likeness, among other civil and criminal violations. In theory, one could close any remaining gaps by criminalizing or attaching civil liability to specific acts. For instance, creating a deep fake of an original person with the intent to deceive a viewer or listener with the expectation that this deception could cause some specific kind of harm. But it could be hard to make these claims or charges stick in practice. To begin with, it will likely prove very difficult to attribute the creation of a deep fake to a particular person or group. And even if perpetrators are identified, they may be beyond the court's reach, as in the case of foreign individuals and governments. Another legal solution could involve incentivizing social media platforms to do more to identify and remove deep fakes or fraudulent content more generally. Under current U.S. law, the companies that own these platforms are largely immune, immune for liability for the content they host, thanks to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. Congress could modify this immunity, perhaps by amending Section 230 to make companies liable for harmful and fraudulent information distributed through their platforms unless they have reasonable efforts to detect and remove it. Other countries have used similar approach for a different problem. In 2017, for instance, Germany passed a law imposing stiff fines on social media companies that failed to remove racist or threatening content within 24 hours of being reported. Yet, this approach could bring challenges of its own. Most notably, it could lead to excessive censorship. Companies anxious to avoid legal liability would likely err on the side of placing content too aggressively, and users themselves might begin to self-censor in order to avoid the risk of having their content suppressed. 
It is fair from obvious that notional benefits of improved fraud protection could justify these costs to free expression. Such a system would also run the risk of insulating incumbent platforms which have their resources to police content and pay for legal battles against competition from smaller firms. Living with lies. But although deep fakes are dangerous, they will not necessarily be disastrous. Detection will improve. Prosecutors and plaintiffs will occasionally win legal victories against their creators of harmful fakes. And the major social media platforms will gradually get better at flagging and removing fraudulent content. The digital uh, provenance solutions could, if widely adopted, provide a more durable fix at some point in the future. In the meantime, democratic societies will have to learn resilience. On the one hand, this will mean accepting that audio and video content cannot be taken at face value. On the other hand, it will mean fighting the descent into post-truth world in which citizens retreat to private information bubbles and regard as fact only that which flatters their own beliefs. In short, democracies will have to accept an uncomfortable truth in order to serve the threat of fakes, they are going to have to learn how to live with lies. Okay, uh, I would like uh, to continue uh, with a couple of brief comments. First, uh, in my Big Lives video series, I talk about uh, institutions um, promote democracy as if it, or a republic as it exists in uh, the United States in particular, and it's widespread in most of the wealthy countries, is um, you can make campaign contributions to politicians and, and uh, pretty much unlimited amounts now, including uh, corporations and uh, non-for-profit, uh, the, the trusts, as they used to call them a long time ago. Um, they used to talk about busting the trusts. So uh, you can create a non-for-profit uh, 501c3 and then um, use that it could be what you consider a good cause which is let's say family values or it could be to promote the interests um, of a large uh, industry or a corporation um, that may not be their interest may not be is what's in the in interest of the majority of uh, Americans uh, so we don't have a democracy. Uh, I know this from having politicians in my family and being in politics that, uh, that most congressmen, senators, judges um, don't really read what they're supposed to read. There's just too much uh, work to be done. And uh, even though they have assistants and staffs, uh, like translating uh, from French, Spanish, um, Hebrew uh, into English, I know that a lot is lost in translation, so if somebody else does the work and not you, there's always something lost uh, in translation. They could be more intelligent and capable, uh, educated individual, uh, more erudite than you, uh, even though you're the congressman, you hire highly qualified people with impressive resumes, and um, they may give you uh, sound summaries and things like that, uh, but um, they may be incorrect. And so our government isn't a democracy. We're run by the lobbyists and by organizations such as the Council on Foreign Relations and the Rain Corporation and, and the U.S. military and other forces, uh, powerful uh, institutions and, um, that are non-elected. Uh, and they set the actual uh, agenda. So it is big, uh, this ability uh, to create uh, pornos of people um, that look uh, real or someone uh, being uh, at a restaurant having a conversation and saying something uh, that would be incriminating or very... Um, slanderous uh, 
toward that person's character. So um, it it is a big deal, and I expect uh, I was caught a year or so ago uh, what, what looked like the beginning of a military confrontation uh, between Russia and the uh, NATO uh, alliance, uh, which is mostly the United States. Um, so it looked like a real uh, newscast that popped up. Um, in my feed, I think it was on Facebook, and uh, it caught, it had me there for a few minutes. I thought maybe uh, World War Three had started, uh, and it, and it had a I think it had CNN or some or MSNBC, one of the major news networks that had you know their logos and everything, quality looking graphics and all that. So this stuff is real. Um, the war between uh, Prussia uh, and uh, the French Empire, where the French lost um, in around 1871, 1872, when Paris was occupied for a considerable amount of time and had to pay huge reparations, and that uh, made uh, a unified uh, Germany out of that war. Uh, a cable that was mistranslated, uh, telegraphs were, you know, they weren't brand new. Uh, they'd been around a couple decades, but um, teletypes and that type of thing. So, m manipulation of uh, technology. And this is also, I'd like to comment as a financial analyst and a forecaster, and my accuracy being uh, perfect so far is that. Uh, I take into account changes in technology. And that's why if you look at different, that's why you can't use a cycle theory of financial markets because things like the steam engine, um, the record player, the telephone, uh, the internal combustion engine, uh, motor cars, uh, jet aircraft, large transportation aircraft, uh, they all these and many other technological advances. So what the market was like 10 or 20 years ago, <coughs> machine, machines can have a massive uh, change on the whole ecosystem of the planet as we see with the uh, all the pollution, uh, the methane, the CO2, the nitrous oxide, the uh, sulfur oxide, and the aluminum and the lead that's in the air from burning coal and fossil fuels and other uh, chemicals uh, poisoning uh, our rivers and streams and uh, waterways uh, which you can't uh, drink or fish out of because of pollution in most parts of the world. <clears throat> That's been a long video but um, I thought this was an excellent article and I uh, also before I go, I'd like to say that Foreign Affairs puts out the big lie that a mechanical uh, modern digital civilization is not collapsing. Uh, it is collapsing. Uh, almost all of Africa is in collapse mode. All of South America and much of Asia, especially uh, the two biggest populous countries, both China and India, have... Uh, tried to in mechanize their uh, civilizations from peasant agricultural um, economies, which would be much better uh, in the long run than trying to mechanize. There are just not enough uh, raw materials in the ground to be mined up and enough uh, fuel to maintain uh, India and uh, China very long. It, they can't even ever get to that point. There's not enough materials to make the cement, the steel, uh, towers for the electrical grid and so forth. It just The crust of the earth doesn't have that much available and there isn't that much uh, fossil fuel or even uranium uh, to electrify uh, the world, the planet earth, uh, all the all the seven and a half billion uh, humans with electricity. There isn't the raw materials so that everyone can you know have 24-hour electricity. Uh, and cities are not sustainable because they bring in minerals and they're not recycled, and uh, minerals are not created by nature, and once you use them, they're used. And it take, can take a thousand years to get one inch of topsoil, <clears throat> and as they degrade and remove the topsoil, let it blow away and erode, um, 
once it's gone, that's why civilizations and large city states um, or city states of the past um, only lasted for a certain period of time and always collapsed because um, once they uh, extracted the the uh, timber uh, back then uh, throughout most of history it was timber and soil um, where you're big in the fisheries and such where you're big natural resources and once you overfish cut down your forests and uh, you only maybe get 70 years or 300 years or whatever the number is uh, and then the soil's exhausted and uh, what used to be lush North Africa uh, Iraq was a uh, rain, was forest, much like we used to have here in Indiana. But they deforested Iraq and Syria and those countries. They weren't deserts. They didn't. The man made those deserts by cutting down the trees. Um, so the, those are the facts. Uh, thank you very much, and I will say au revoir, mon ami.